again the like, how you guys feeling about everything? So, um, as usual, we'll just start the day with a couple of these things. Yes, that's exactly right. Does that make sense to everyone? 
You can't do it with a single assembly table, but if you just had two of them, every time you get a put method by key and value, you call the put method on the first one, and on the second one, you call the put method by value and then by key. Yeah? Like, why? Like, but it's not necessarily invertible, though. Like, even if you allow only one value per key, like, you have multiple keys. Uh huh. Right. So you, you would have to change uh, the definition of the API of what that means. That's a good point, though. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm issue. Okay, um, and how would that ordered symbol table keep track of the popular words? Okay, so if you already have um, a symbol table that keeps track of the frequencies of all the words that you've seen so far, then you can call the, uh, what is it, the select function n times. How, what, what would you have to do though in the get method or in the put method or whatever to make sure that when you get a new when you get a new word, you're able to update the symbol table so that it keeps track of the frequency counts of all the words. Uh huh. Right. So you would first um, check if the key is in there. If it's not in there, you would insert it with a value of one. If it's already in there, you would do a get. You would look at the value, increment by one, and then put it back in. Bonus question. Can you do it in a space? Well, what's the space for this? So if, you, if you're getting n words here, and you're only asked for the m popular words, the symbol table data structure would require a space proportional to n, right? What about, can you do it in proportional to m space? Priority queue. Priority queue, go on. How would that work? <laughs> All right. Who thinks the answer is yes? Who thinks the answer is no? Um. Yes, okay, I'm hearing some yeses. Am I hearing any no's? We should have some more Yeah, yep. No, you think it's no? Why is it no? Uh, well, okay, so like, I guess it's like, you have some, it's like, you know, the minimum, that you have to go for, right? Uh-huh. So, like, in order to, like, like, you don't have to do like that, you have to have some sort of, like, other score, and you should, like, track it, that all of the end, so that that's important. That's, that's a pretty good explanation. Here's, here's how, here's how I would put it. Let's say there are capital N possible words, right? Big N, not, not M. You have to remember for each of those N words how many times you've seen them so far. It's not enough to remember the popular words up until this point. Why? Because the least popular guy could suddenly get a wave of support and then climb up all the way to the top, and there's no way you can produce the correct answer in response to that kind of situation unless you've been tracking everybody's popularity all along. And so that's why you need space proportional to N. And then more broadly, you know, we picked this because it has that texture of priority queue. Yeah. And it seems like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing you do with priority queue. But if you give it a little more thought, you realize... You were hoping somebody would say priority queue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, here's the thing I want to tell you guys. Uh, this is about how associative arrays are treated in various programming languages. And the context for this is, when I think about what, I, what data structures I use when I program, like associative arrays, I use that term instead of symbol tables, but they're really the same thing. I use it far more than any other data structure, like by far. Um, it's probably like 20 times more often than I would ever use a stack. I think I've used the task stack maybe three times in my life, and two of them were when solving the first time. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but this one is really, really very useful. Like, it was kind of funny for me to see the applications of symbol table slide, because to me, everything is an application of a symbol picture about like this work. So um, one of the possible ways you can implement a symbol table is, uh, as, as mentioned in the online lectures or in the book, is you can keep uh, an ordered list where we have a link list and if we want to find something, um, we just step through the list and we get there eventually. And so even though everything here is in order, we can't get to the thing we want because it takes a long time to get there. Um, so we have to follow all these links. So one solution, which we won't talk about here, is the so-called skip list, where you add express lanes and you can bypass if you need to. 
Um, so this is actually a fairly popular, some, somewhat popular uh, thing in practice, but it's non-standard. And the strange thing is that these express links are probabilistic. And this is a whole big field. And the guy who made this, by the way, is the same guy who wrote fine bugs, which I think is neat. Um, so um, that's a skip list, but we're not going to talk about it. Instead, what we're going to do is think about how we can change a link list to be more efficient. So one thing we could do is stick our pointer in the middle. So that would be cool, because then um, it gives us maybe th this side we get to faster. Um, but what's the problem here? These guys are lost. So what could we do, maybe? Well, I wouldn't necessarily double link. I mean, we could. I'm going to be minimalist with my links and just flip these, right? So at this point, I have a linked list that now is half, as, uh, it does everything twice as fast. Now, is it actually useful in practice for a giant linked list? No. Why? Still linear. So we want to dream big here. We don't want to just stop with this. What we can do at this link is we can make all the links do big jumps. So in this case, uh, if we want to follow the binary search tree, where do you think this link's going to go? I heard a murmur of B, maybe? And a D. What we could do is make a big jump here. And now we run into that same problem we did before, where some of the elements are inaccessible. So what do we want to do here? Flip that link. OK, we do that. And we can repeat this process uh, in general with the linked list. And we'll eventually arrive at a shape something like this, uh, which is just a binary search tree in disguise. So that's all a binary search tree is. Just a linked list where you do this process. It was ordered in the first place. Now, this isn't a good way to necessarily, this isn't a good way to build the binary search tree because you have to go through and build this giant linked list. And so our goal is going to be concerned with building something that approximates this structure as practically as possible. And that's the topic of the rest of today and all of next lecture. All right? So what's nice about this is now we can get places a lot faster. In fact, we have the, the process of finding things and inserting things is related to the height. So if we have a so in the worst case, if our height as h, we're going to have to do, say, three compares here. Our height is 2 um, in order to get where we want. Um, and our practical overall, what we're going to do is we're going to have disordered data. We're not going to get everything fed to us in order to be able to have linked lists to start with. So we're going to try and figure out how to do flip and delete efficiently. Okay? So let me give you a picture of um, how the process works. And you guys have seen this with Bob, but I just want to go over it again. So the best we can possibly do is logarithmic if our tree is really nice. And if my, where's my mouse first? There you are. Okay, so as you guys remember, the, the side to side motion is accommodating tricky you notes. Know, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so Fortunately, we don't have to compile them. Yeah, we're <laughs> compiling. Okay, so one thing that I think doesn't necessarily come across super well um, without doing it is how this code looks exactly. If you want to implement these operations, you guys have some feeling for So my suggested exercise sometime before the midterm, this isn't urgent. Um, this very simple uh, BSD. API, I would recommend that you guys try to implement this to see the feeling for how the recursive code looks. And you can compare against our official rep, uh, on, the, on the book side. Um, so we're going to do these two together today, get the put, and try the delete methods. They're tricky on your own. And then in assignment five, um, you'll get a lot of feeling for this stuff. You will not see, you won't get to do any deleting. So if you ever want to write delete code for a recursive tree structure, this is your chance. Um, so let's start. Let's talk about what these methods will look like. Okay. Method, our ultimate goal is going to return the value corresponding to the current key. So this very common practice that you'll see over and over again when you're doing these recursive structures is we want to make something else. What do you guys think? Some kind of special let. Uh, well, yeah, case, but I want a little helper method. So that's going to be my first thing I want to do here. So um, the idea is that this helper method is going to walk through our tree. Um, I've got some trouble. Okay, so the idea is yeah. And whenever git happens, all it's going to do is we're going to pass the block over to our help method, and we're going to say, okay, I want to get um, the key start. Where are we going to start looking? Root. Okay, so that's how our method begins, and we're going to do it. Okay, now is where we have to start thinking about when we're crawling through this tree. So the first thing we're going to do, not really, but what we're thinking, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the comparison. We're going to say, um, how does, the current, how does the key that we're looking for compare to the current key, right? So this is that step where you're trying to decide which way to go. Um, if compare is equal to zero, what happens then? Return yeah, we're going to return the value. Okay, good. And if compare is less, then what do we do? Okay, get x uh, 
left key. Um, that's not quite what we want though, right? So after we get it, what do we need to do? So git's going to return something. So what do we want to do? What do you guys think? It would just return that. So it's very concise and you can just say, okay, well, whatever, I can't help. I, I don't know. I don't know where the thing is, but that guy will. So whatever he says, I'm going to send it back to you. Um, okay. Um, and then to clear, then pattern matching, you guys know, will be next up, right? Key. Okay, so we're not quite done now. So what's the issue so far? There's one thing wrong. So we can fall off our tree, right? So we had a case where we might get to the point where x left is null. So if it's null, what do we want to do? We're going to return something. Null. So the idea here is we fall off the tree and there's no information here. Um, and if this code runs and the key is not at the table, what's going to ultimately happen? It'll be null. So null is going to be the value that times back up. Now, in retrospect, I realized it would be nice to have a picture that goes with this, but I don't. Uh, but so this is what the get method will look like. And this is a very common pattern. So I just want you guys, you guys to see the thought process that goes into developing this recursive method. There's a public history method, and then it's calling this private history method with a mysterious, no best argument. So the thing about it is, we try to follow the recursion and try to see what it's doing, and try to see which of these functions it might and one suggestion I have is if you have paper, maybe make up a small example. That's how I solve it, because I'm lazy. But Arvin tried to do it in his head. Um, but let's, let's look at this visually and try to see what it's doing. So let's focus on these two. Maybe it's ceiling or floor, because the others are looking kind of unlikely. Um, so let's try and see if we can figure out which one of those it might be. So here's what's going on. Here's, here's the code over there again. And here's the comparison function. And here's how it's going to go through the tree. Which side of the tree are we going to go now? We're comparing M to L, so which side of the tree is that going to be? Right, we're going to go to the right. And we're going to retain S as the value of best. Why? Because we're over here now. And so what function does that correspond to? Ceiling, exactly. So ceiling is the right answer. Do we have one more visualization um, for this? A little bit, yeah. So then at that point, the end just walks back up the tree. Yeah. Um, okay, so the end goes back up, and I think that honestly the way I solved this problem was I just made one up and then did it, and then kind of inductively decided that I was correct. And that's a pretty reasonable uh, approach, honestly, with these kind of problems. Alright, so I want to talk a little bit about the delete process, it's a little tricky. Um, so I'm going to give the, the conceptual picture again in a slightly different way, um, and the code will be for you guys to ruminate on later. Okay, so when you want to delete something out of a tree, and search, that's no big deal. Find where it's going to go, put it in, we're good. If you want to delete something, we have three cases, and two of them are very easy. So here's the first one. If we want to delete something with no child, what do we need to do? Set what link in the node? Which, which link do we want to set to null? Yeah, eyes child, this bright red one. So indeed, there we go. And now we're spinning free in the universe and garbage can he can be collected. Um, so when you write the recursive Let's do that social network thing. Okay. That's kind of fun. All right. Sounds good. So first thing I want to do is this design problem. So you guys need to think about a right into Netzwerk, right? <laughs> That's a German company. Minimalist. Yeah, they're minimalist. You know how Germans are. And there's two buttons on their website when you log in. You can either click the Neu button with the flat hand. <laughs> no, relax. And what happens is if you're logged in and I type in, say, Maya, and click Neu, we are now friends. The other thing I can do is I can pick another person, say, Arvin, and I can press the Everitizen that's there button. <laughs> and it will tell me whether or not there is some chain of friends between the two of us. So what I want you guys to do is pick at least one API that they'll want to use to implement this process. There may be more than one answer. So think about what Everitizen that's there should be doing. <laughs> so any group, uh, actually, what you should do, I would say, you can do it in groups if you want, or just send it solo. Alright. So Union Fine is winning by 75%. What might be the other one other than Union Fine? Yeah, because we've been talking about it all through the lecture. That's got to be one of the answers, right? You could have guessed that. Um, okay, so Union Fine is kind of obvious why we need them. Why, why do we need a symbol table here? Right. So what, what would happen? What would be the problem if we didn't have the symbol table? 
And then Unifind would have to directly take usernames as arguments and try to do connected and find queries. But it doesn't know how to do that. What does Unifind take as keys? What is its equivalent of keys? Right, it's just consecutive integers. That's what it knows what to do with, right? It just works on an array of consecutive, uh, or the indexes are consecutive integers. And so to go from usernames uh, to those indexes, that's kind of why a symbol table is essential. Um, all right, let's think about this. We've got n users, m operations. We're not saying if m is bigger than m or the other way around, it can be anything, right? So what is the worst case running time? Think about it for a minute. Right, it's an extremely slowly, slowly growing function. By the way, there's another function that's even more badass than that. It's called Ackerman's function. Uh, Google that if you're interested. Like when I saw the Ackerman function, I was kind of scared. That's how, that's how weird that function. So that's how a lot of tables ended up on its walls. <laughs> do a few. Ackerman is probably the weirdest function I've seen in my life. But anyway, the operations for union find are only, or at least the connected query, are only going to be log star n which is less than log n, but it doesn't matter because uh, for the symbol table, we have log n, which is bigger than that anyway, right? So we have log n for a single operation, and we have m operations, so it's pretty much going to be m times log n. Let's think about this. This is about amortized complexity. I know that a lot of you guys had questions about amortized complexity and how it's different from average case. This is a good way to work through all that. So what you have is a symbol table, or really any data structure whose um, Let's define the amortized complexity as 4 log n for n operations. But what does that exactly mean? What are we defining here? Here are three possible definitions. One is starting from an empty data structure, that's the key phrase, a sequence of n inserts and searches uses n log n. Or it could be any sequence of n inserts and searches, no need to start with an empty data structure. Or we're starting from an empty data structure, the expected number is 4 log n, but there's a small probability that it could take like 5 log n or whatever. So think about this, and think about which, which one or more of these are the right definition for amortized complexity. Yeah, this definition is too strict because it says any sequence of um, insert and switch operations, it doesn't tell you when that sequence starts. So if you start counting right before a resize operation is about to happen, then that, you know, that definition will still say it only has to use 4 times 2 times log 2 compares, which is equal to what? 8, exactly. So even if a resize is about to happen, it doesn't care what the existing size of the array is. That's the key thing to keep in mind. This n here, it has nothing to do with the size of the array. It's just the number of insert and, and search operations. So that's why definition number two breaks. If a resize is about to happen, then that won't hold true. So one is actually uh, the only right definition. And that one is, because yeah, that's the definition. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Bob said that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, though. It's useful. All right, so anyway, so that's what we have today. There's one, actually, we have, we'll, we'll move our interview question to the next lecture. Yeah. Right? So every, every class, we're going to move the interview question to the very end of the next lecture, all right? And then maybe at the end, we'll see you. <laughs> there you go. This is not happening today. All right, thanks, everybody.